I think everybody realizes that if there is one date in our nearly 100-year history uh, that matters, it's 1966. Because in that year, this university um, jumped into the national spotlight by winning the National Basketball Championship. And it was such a Cinderella story, such an amazingly um, inspiring story, that I think um, we have ever since that date enjoyed a tremendous uh, amount of attention and uh, recognition every year during the Final Four. Uh, we just constantly get opportunities to celebrate and re-celebrate uh, that very special moment in our history. At the time, that victory represented for intercollegiate athletics one of the most important breakthroughs in terms of diversity that had occurred up until that point. No institution, no university, no basketball team had ever had the courage, frankly, to start five black players in an NC2A final game. Coach Haskins played, as he said, always his five best players, and they all happened to be African American. And I think that made an, an enormous statement as well uh, for, the, for the country. Um, it said that there should be absolutely no racial barrier for participation in intercollegiate athletics. And what made it even sweeter was that Adolph Rupp, the coach of the University of Kentucky, uh, our opponent in that championship game, um, had been known uh, to refuse to recruit black players to his team. And so he was known to be opposed to the participation of African Americans. And so the victory became even sweeter um, because we essentially defeated a team that represented exactly the opposite way of thinking. And so that was very exciting, I think, for all of us. Um, but it's also, of course, been uh, a major milestone in the history of intercollegiate athletics nationally. He was a, truly a great man. I mean, he, he, was, he was a very inspiring fellow, though at times extremely exasperating fellow, because he, he was uh, kind of monomaniacal about basketball. What he knew was basketball, and what he spent all of his time thinking about and, and um, planning and, and um, sort of wrestling constantly in his own mind with was being the best basketball coach he could be, not only to win games, but also to be a good mentor for the young people uh, who were entrusted to him by their families and who came long distances to play in El Paso, Texas. And um, he was exasperating because um, as a result of that kind of in intense focus on basketball, um, there were many other things that he didn't pay much attention to, and that was, of course, what we tried to help him with. And, and there were always moments when I, when I really had to laugh at uh, the kinds of situations that we sometimes found ourselves in. But what was great about him was that he was always um, a man of goodwill. I, I respected so much his generosity. He was a very quiet philanthropist. He helped many, many people in this region uh, across the border. He did many, many things that were truly generous and kind and never wanted any, any publicity or any kind of glory for that. Um, he, he, had, he derived the satisfaction uh, even of his national championship he never really enjoyed so much the national limelight. It was the satisfaction that he had in having achieved that. He didn't need a national spotlight to, to sort of bask in. That wasn't his style. And so he was a very complex person. I think a lot of people saw him as kind of a character and, you know, kind of, kind of unusual in terms of little things that he did, like his pull off bow tie and a lot of other things that he, he did, but really deep down he was a great man. Mm -hmm. Even after he retired, he was very much a part of the university and so I worked with him um, closely for the final years of his career. Um, and even there, I mean, I think 
he handled himself extraordinarily well. It's difficult uh, for someone to move away from something about which they have so much passion. And, and as I said, he, he was totally passionate about basketball and, and monomaniacal about it. I mean, he really did have a, a focus on it that was intense. And so walking away from that has to be extraordinarily uh, challenging. And I thought he did a very, very nice job of, of being gracious to his successors and staying out of the limelight in every way that he could, at the same time enjoying very much the glory that came uh, to the 1966 team with the Glory Road film and all of the other more recent attention, uh, 40th anniversary of that celebration and so on. The movie Glory Road gave us a new opportunity to not only celebrate the 1966 national championship and the fact that we're the only school in Texas that has ever won the national basketball championship and <clears throat> to kind of remind everyone in this generation about that whole story and what it represented. But it also gave us an opportunity to celebrate Coach Haskins and uh, the players and to give them once again uh, the recognition that they were denied in 1966. I mean, I think the fact that a movie was made about them which triggered then the invitation to the White House, uh, which enabled them uh, to get the kind of recognition that in 1966 clearly wasn't viewed as appropriate. So every national championship team would go on the Ed Sullivan show on television, but not the 1966 team. There had to be a reason for that. And I think <clears throat> having denied them that recognition then, it was particularly satisfying to see them portrayed in the way they were in the movie. And one of the most special evenings that I ever had was going to uh, the movie theater here in El Paso on the night of the premiere with Coach Haskins and the entire team and the entire cast of the film and Jerry Bruckheimer uh, and the director, everybody there, um, Josh Lucas, everybody was there. And watching the movie, watching the players watch the movie, watching the players watch the actors, watching the actors watch the players watch the movie, and all of that, that dynamic, which was so intense, the actors wanting the players to approve of how they portrayed them, the players eager to see how they were portrayed, uh, Coach Haskins trying to act like it didn't matter at all that he was in a movie, um, I think, um, and sort of aw shucksing as he always did, you know, oh no, it's not about me, and so on. So it was, it was a wonderfully uh, interesting evening, and, and sort of everyone playing their particular part in the premiere, not only in the movie, but in the, in the premiere. Uh, that, was, that was really a lovely time. And then the other, the other premiere in, in Los Angeles, um, the excitement of the players themselves and their families, the excitement that they felt in walking down the red carpet um, in Hollywood and, and being um, photographed and cheered on and so on, uh, all the recognition that they didn't get before, uh, they did get. And I think that was a very, very nice way of wrapping up the 40th anniversary of that extraordinarily ac uh, fine accomplishment for UTEP. UTEP has always been at the forefront of um, very interesting dynamics. And I think that we said um, a few years ago, just as in 1966, we changed the face of intercollegiate athletics, we are changing the face of higher education in the 21st century. We're changing the face of higher education in the sense that we have not been willing to write off talent simply because it's poor or it's minority or whatever, which is what traditional universities have unfortunately done. The underrepresentation of Hispanics in particular in higher education is 
absolutely unacceptable if this country hopes to be successful. And I think UTEP has had the courage to stand up to some of the sacred cows, like SAT scores and graduation rates and other kinds of metrics that are simply correlated with family income. Everybody knows that, and yet we continue to use those as a means of keeping people out of higher education. That can't continue, and UTEP has had the courage and is now increasingly recognized as being the institution that's turning this country's attitudes around. It's hard work. We don't have the same benefit of a single national championship to be able to change the face of higher ed the way we change the face of intercollegiate athletics by making that powerful, punchy statement. But we're making many punchy statements along the way, and little by little, we are, in fact, changing the face of higher education in the United States. I think 25 years from now, UTEP is going to be viewed as having made that contribution to higher education in the same way that the 1966 team is now viewed, wasn't in its day viewed as, as having done the right thing, if you will. But today it's recognized as having changed the face of intercollegiate athletics. It takes time for people to adjust. And I think that we are in the forefront and we're absolutely going to um, change the way higher education does its business.